and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan. On the 25th of April, a deadly earthquake measuring 7.8 on the Richter scale struck our northern neighbor, Nepal. The death toll as of now from that earthquake and the second earthquake which struck on May 12th stands at around 9,000. All told, it is estimated that about 25,000 people in Nepal have been injured. The physical destruction, the scale of physical destruction has been enormous. Something like 5 lakh, 500,000 homes have been completely destroyed and estimates are that anywhere from 2.5 lakh to 3 lakh homes have been partially destroyed. At one level, the death toll and the scale of physical destruction are testimony to the kind of tragedy that has visited Nepal. But one month later or six weeks later, what's the mood in Nepal? How have reconstruction efforts been going on? To discuss that and other related issues, we have with us today a very special guest from Nepal, Kanak Mani Dikshit, editor of Himal, a founding editor of Himal, leading and very well-known uh, mm -hmm. public commentator on uh, Nepali affairs. Uh, uh, Kanak, it's been now six weeks, uh, more or less. The last major aftershock, I suppose, uh, was a couple of weeks ago, two, three weeks back. Yeah. Uh, how is the public mood today? Do, are people still, um, you know, in perpetual fear about after effects, shocks, etc., or uh, is there now some semblance of normality within the context of the terrible destruction that has happened? I think the people were coming back to a sense of normalcy when the May 12th earthquake struck, and suddenly people went back into their cocoon, so to speak. And uh, I think the given that the aftershocks continue at four, 4.5 Richter continuously till till today. Uh, people are not yet back to feeling the normalcy. Uh, neither is the economy uh, back to any sense of normalcy. Though many uh, of the hundreds of th well hundreds of thousands that evacuated Kathmandu Valley have begun to return, but uh, I don't get a sense as yet that the economy is you know uh, moving back. Is it is it common for uh people to leave uh, buildings at, uh, you know, when in the face of aftershocks even today? Or is it, is it less, less and less now? Uh, less and less. Because right. people have, they're also joking about it now, you know, like they themselves want to check out the Richter scale and, you know, informally bet among them. Black humor. What was, yeah, what was the Richter scale. Nepal has, um, interestingly, uh, sensors all over, these um, seismic sensors. And interestingly, Unlike uh, even India and, uh, and China, uh, Nepal immediately comes out with the data. So within five minutes, the public at, at, everywhere will know from the mobile phones where was the epicenter, how deep was it. And so this is an interesting, uh, and what is the Richter scale? Right, right. This is the, an interesting aspect. The other interesting aspect amidst all the tragedy was one, the international response, which proved that Nepal has perhaps the highest per capita goodwill around the world for some reason. Other looking for good news amidst the tragedy is that there's a whole group of young adult professionals that came up with voluntary spirit within Nepal. So what the, uh, the immediate aftermath of the earthquake was that there was no government. The politicians were not there to lead from the front. So the, the public at large on the ground did what they could. And then the surge of new volunteerism that came up, not the NGOs, the INGOs, right. others, but individuals that gathered and uh, in a way uh, managed the immediate rescue. So there are certain um, aspects that you can see as perhaps will help Nepal in the medium to long term, given how they reacted now. Are we in a position today to say that uh, the uh, challenge of immediate relief, even in remote places in Gorkha or Lamjung, uh, uh, has been overcome and that now Nepal is in the phase of medium to long-term rehabilitation? Or would you say that there are still um, areas where people are fending for themselves? There are pockets where people are fending for themselves because keep in mind that Nepal's terrain uh, has two aspects, this mid-hill and the high mountain regions where the earthquake epicenter was and where the largest destruction happened. One is this is among the most inhospitable hospitable terrain in the world. Right. Secondly, it is uh, the mountain region with the highest population density in the world. But these are not uh, communities 
uh, that are built together, scattered houses. Right. So it's very difficult. And very, to very reach. little, very little road connectivity. In fact, uh, there is some, and luckily those roads which have been the subject of great denigration because they've been environmentally unsound in their building. But given that, and they would close up during the monsoon, but this was pre-monsoon. Right. So you could actually use the roads. If not a jeep, even a motorbike could get. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, um, we were able to use these roads. But the way to look at this earthquake is that it was a very, as, as I've written once before, a very class-conscious earthquake, meaning the, it hit uh, houses that used mud mortar. So if you look at some of these videos that have come out of Nepal, right. the videos scan across the landscape and it's like mortar rounds landing in a battle battlefield. Mountain regions with puffs of smoke, wherever there was a house, mud mortar of the poor and marginalized. Right. Right. Puff, puff, puff everywhere. So this so, gives so, you... So cement, brick, RCC structures all uh, withstood the earthquake in the main? By and large, because we had been told to expect in a large earthquake a a lakh dead. Right. In the end, thank God, we have got uh, no more than 9,000. Um, so you would say that uh, for the nature of this earthquake, because right. it did not become a quote-unquote great earthquake. Right. It was 7.8. Uh, and as a result, the kind of movement, the directionality, the depth, etc., all of that meant that uh, mud mortar houses got hit. Cement houses may have fallen... By and large, they didn't, although there was quite a lot of destruction in Kathmandu. If you go through the streetscapes, you'll see a whole streetscape looking intact, but then a house in the middle of it falls down. Um, the heritage places were, uh, right. were also hit because they were mud mortar. Yeah. The, the palaces, the stupas, uh, the old palaces, the old uh, monuments, all bit of mud mortar. So tell me, uh, going forward, I mean, does the Nepal government, with its bureaucracy and at one level, it's dysfunctional politics, which we perhaps will come yes, to at the yes. end. Have the uh, capacity to absorb and use what I hope will be billions of dollars of aid internationally, or is that going to be, be a challenge? That how, how this money is spent and uh, you know, ensuring the, the, that it's done effectively? Uh, the tragedy of this earthquake was that the politicians who have been ruling the center stage, hogging the limelight for a decade and a half, they disappeared from all media for the first two weeks. They did not have a credibility either to face the public. Part party organizations didn't uh, no uh, take any kind no. of a role in relief. Now they're making more noise than they should, okay. trying to take advantage. Opportunism versus opportunity to rebuild. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity that started, surf opportunism that started servicing, uh, surfacing about two and a half, three weeks after the earthquake. But in the beginning, for the first two weeks, it was the people left to themselves. The bureaucracy uh, really held up the medical and public health uh, um, aspects of the government kicked in. Um, things were not as bad as the immediate aftermath uh, reportage would uh, have you believe. Right. The army, the armed police and the civilian police also were in there. Um, this government's success was the ability to keep that enormous international response within control. Right. The tragedy was that the government, and particularly the Prime Minister, Mr. Sushil Koirala, was not able to show the face of compassion because he's a person of that personality. Right. He's a quiet reserved uh, person. and reserved yeah. person. So you would say that the face of the government uh, and the weak was... Uh, not there. The political leadership of all parties just went into a deep background. Right. But the, I personally think that the, the security forces and the bureaucracy, they did the best they could, even though there was tragically no elected local government. Right. If we had had, we haven't had elected local government because of the various political right. problems within Nepal for the last dozen years. As a result, there was no authority in the village. Right. There was nobody to go to, right. either for rescue of right. a person in the rubble, right. or uh, no authority to uh, ensure that the supplies okay. that did come in were equitably distributed. In the, in the couple of minutes we have before we take a break, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, the impact of the quake on Nepal's heritage. Uh, 
at one level, this is something which has struck many people as uh, particularly tragic. And for, for the people in Nepal too, uh, to yeah. lose some of these monuments. Uh, uh, is the situation irreparable, irretrievable? It has, is there, not, has there been um, you know, any looting of, of, of artifacts, heritage, etc.? Fortunately, we haven't heard of... We're, the public was alert enough, I think, in each, even in the absence of government or the security forces, the public was alert enough to protect a lot of the Excellent. monuments. I myself was part of some of these exercises. Kathmandu Valley is a, truly a jewel of South Asian and world civilization in the sense that it is a very accomplished uh, city-state civilization, Kathmandu Valley, which means that there are a lot of monuments. But we are in a seismic zone, so we also know that historically these buildings have come down and, and been have rebuilt. been rebuilt. So I think that, no, it is not irretrievable. There are certain uh, aspects one would mention. One is that the Dharara Spire, it is a minar, uh, built about 180 years ago. This fell. is the so-called clock tower in Kathmandu. Uh, not a clock tower. Or, this one is the minar. Okay. Clock tower stood. Okay. But the minar uh, built by Bhimsen Thapa, a, a muktiar, a prime minister, of 170, 80 years ago, it has fallen twice and rebuilt. This time, the world as a whole does not notice it because it was the tallest building. It has value for Nepalese of the district, districts, because they regard, the villagers of Nepal regard this statue, this minar, uh, tower, as a kind of a mm, mm, uh, uh, symbol of the Nepali state, of Kathmandu Valley as right. a jewel. As a result, when it fell, it impacted the districts a lot. But the temples that fell down, the old palaces that came down, it has, uh, of course, hurt the sensibility, but also it hurts the economy. Right. And it also hurts the intangible heritage that is linked to these individual monuments. So yes, yeah. the monuments have come down, but they can and they will be rebuilt. Right. Uh, on that note, we will take a break. Uh, when, when we come back, uh, we will talk about the Indian aid effort and the controversial topic of the Indian media's coverage of Nepal relief efforts. Keep watching IST. Welcome back. My guest today is Kanak Mani Dikshit, editor, public commentator from Nepal. Kanak, one of the uh, aspects of the Nepal earthquake um, has been the uh, interesting aspects has been the scale and the uh, promptness of the Indian relief effort which is coming for a lot of praise in India, of course, uh, around the world, people have noticed. How has the Indian effort played out in Nepal? Um, have, you know, there, we've seen some reports of, and we'll you know, look at the media issue a little bit separately, but there's been some reports of uh, people in Nepal um, looking at this aid as being driven by geopolitical motives and so on and so on. I mean, tell us something about what, how the man in the street or the person in the street I think uh, that, that type of criticism doesn't have much traction. Um, as you said, the Indian assistance was immediate and generous. Um, I think the Prime Minister had met in India. Um, Mr. Narendra Modi has met with his team to consider the Nepal earthquake within a couple of hours. Right. And uh, the assistance was dispatched immediately, starting with that day. And so in that sense, I think uh, there are many, many untold stories of how well the Indian effort uh, has played out in Nepal because uh, everything from putting back the electricity grid on track uh, to um, a dozen helicopters uh, uh, providing lifting capability that you really needed because our, the hit area, um, the population is scattered in individual hamlets and households. Um, there were some problems in terms of just the sheer volume of uh, uh, flights coming into Kathmandu and the need for coordination between mm -hmm. the various um, contingents that came in with relief. Uh, but uh, I think on the whole, the Indian effort has been good and it has been appreciated. And the, the criticism in relation to geopolitics, uh, I think I don't think that was the first thing in the mind of uh, the Indian authorities right. when they pro decided to provide support. It is true that India is not the only government that has provided support. It is the largest. But there is the United States has come in, the UK, the Chinese, also with helicopters. 
fewer in number. The Sri Lankans, the Pakistanis, the Bangladeshis, either in terms of food aid or otherwise. I think in that sense, uh, perhaps India's coming in immediately helped others also to, to rush there, uh, and, to, to and generous, come in yeah. and be generous. That might have happened. Uh, uh, going forward, uh, what kind of engagement uh, do you think India should maintain on the relief and rehabilitation? Here is what side? I think, uh, because now we have to go from, um, from rescue into relief. Now we have to go towards reconstruction. And uh, there, um, I personally think that the Nepali government, because the political parties are still quarreling, particularly the constitution is still not written, uh, by the looks of it, uh, the political parties are not that energized about going in for local government elections, which is very important for even to ensure money is collected to spend with accountability. So, given the nature of the Nepali politics of the moment, uh, that we are in a quagmire, our government may not have the full credibility and the ability to make demands of the international community for reconstruction. Okay. So, where India could come in uh, as a friend and as a friend that has shown itself uh, as very positive in the relief and rehab effort is to come in with a good tranche of contribution for the uh, uh, reconstruction effort. That again might give momentum for the rest of the world to come in because as things stand, I think Nepal needs uh, six to seven billion dollars to reconstruct because keep in mind one thing. 14 districts were badly affected out of 75 of Nepal's district. But the entire economy has been hit in so many ways, from, from tourism to services to industries. Uh, there's just our uh, growth rate uh, now is pegged at, was supposed to be 5 GDP growth rate. It's been brought down to about 3.5, maybe even 3. Right. So in that sense, the <clears throat> Indian government's assistance for reconstruction would ensure and in a way make up for some of the weaknesses of the Nepali polity itself. What's the status of the planned uh, do international donor conference? It is uh, about to happen. Um, it's slated for 25 June and my personal worry is that the Nepali politicians are not as yet geared and focused on uh, doing it properly, although it cannot be done elsewhere. Uh, Prime Minister Modi in India has also offered to host it in New Delhi. But for geopolitical and national reasons, Nepal needs to do it in Nepal, right. in Kathmandu. So it would be, uh, so it's going to happen on 25 June. Uh, from, as I see, it, the focus in Nepal, at least for the last week, has derailed towards uh, the negotiations and bargaining for a national government. At a time when there are still bodies under the rubble of landslides and buildings in faraway places. So uh, there was a kind of an unbecoming haste as we speak. So again, the international community has to come in and also try to make up for the weaknesses of the Nepali Political, politics, right. as must uh, those of us who are in Nepali civil society, right. media, and in the world of commentary. You mentioned media, um, and of course, the performance of the Indian media on the ground in Nepal came in for considerable amount of criticism. Of what went wrong? Mainly it has to do with television media. Okay. And of course, I mean, those of us who are in the neighborhood of India, we do watch uh, Indian television and we watch it askance to see the kind of shouting heads, not even talking heads. Um, I was watching a program yesterday as I arrived in Delhi and there were 10 people in a program and all of them shouting at each other. So this is the general... Uh, nature of television program for whatever reason in India. Maybe it's the TRP, maybe it's a competition, whatever it is. Now, when this television crew arrived in, uh, in Nepal, the whole focus was, uh, it seems, A, to be, well, not all of them, of course, because I myself gave interviews to many television channels, so I don't want to paint everybody with the same brush. But the sense that the Nepali public got was that one was there was a, Extreme lack of insensitivity on the, on the part of many television reporters. Insen in, how you, in, in terms of framing questions. In okay. how you address okay. uh, somebody who has just lost uh, a near and dear one. Right. Uh, going right there, mic to the face, that is one. The other is uh, exaggerating or at, not exaggerating, but lionizing the role of the Indian military in 
the support that is brought. And so the ne Indian television channel managers forgetting that the Nepali population is also an audience of Indian television. Right. It's not like you go to a faraway country right. and you come back. Because if anything, the Nepali uh, public is also an audience of Indian channels. So the, so the public is witnessing some of the antics of these reporters on the street, as it were, yes. and then also watching the telecast of the stuff. Precisely. Yeah. Because, and this is where people miss out that Nepal, of course, is a different sovereign country. But it is, in a way, oh, the market is cross-border. So I think there was a, quite a lot of dissatisfaction. Uh, much of it came out not in the mainstream media, but in the social media, including a very famous hashtag called Indian Media Go Home. I would say that it came up, uh, there was, in a way, immediate contrition from some parts of the Indian television media. There was a kind of attempt to uh, correct the kind of misreporting or problematic reporting that are going on. But I'm, I'm in a sense, uh, I'm satisfied that this idea of mm, boorishness in television uh, coverage and in discussion that you see uh, in all over South Asia, in many ways led by Indian television, uh, it came into question, and I think it will probably do all of us a lot of good. Right. Uh, I mean, there were also positive initiatives. I mean, I, I, I remember getting, a, getting an email from a uh, young uh, uh, reporting, I mean, a young journalist colleague who uh, was trying to raise money to send uh, battery packs that Nepali reporters could use to power their laptops in situations where... Oh, uh, yes. And that was a very successful initiative. I, I, I would tell you that yeah. uh, not only uh, within Nepal did the young... Professionals come into them their own, but all over the world, as well as in many parts of India as well, there was such a spontaneous um, feeling of wanting to support. I was in a uh, remote area in southern Lalitpur district, and I saw a car come up with uh, Uttar Pradesh number plate, and it said uh, uh, in Nepali, "Bipat uh, and." Uh, uh, relief for earthquake and this was uh, a team that was coming on its own using the open border and just coming up to to help uh, Nepal so I think there was a lot of that right. the, the, the critical point I would make is not to exaggerate it beyond bounds I would say Indian television came in a lot of coverage that it did help generate worldwide support for Nepal there was some exaggeration some boorishness that was immediately highlighted in Nepal that then that got highlighted elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, think there's been some contrition. I mean, some, some reporters and editors have been defensive, but I think in the main, the point has been well taken. I, I, I think that's, uh, that, that is true indeed, because I myself, again, was in programs yeah. to discuss, discuss the, the, the excess in coverage. Uh, I would just make one extra point that I think in, on the ground, uh, this type of reportage, in a way, took away a little bit of the credit that the Indian government uh, should have got for its generous response. That it created a sort of a sidetrack right. and a bit of a controversy. So the jingoism of the media actually backfires. And, 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 Up to a point. Yeah. Uh, and just a quick quick comment on how the uh, Nepali TV uh, covered this. I mean, was, was there greater sensitivity in the I way think, uh, uh, Nepali no, reporters? I would say, I would say that the, the uh, Nep Radio Nepal, which okay. is a government-owned entity, um, came into its own because private sector radio, uh, which in which Nepal is a real um, pioneer, flag really pioneer yeah, in yeah. South Asia, FM radio all over. The Nepal has about 300 uh, FM radio stations. Many of them actually were in the affected areas and they were having to uh, do their programming and they still do from tents and from fields and terraces. But Radio Nepal acted as a real uh, information glue at this time when people all over were in crisis and there was nobody to help them. So radio, I think, did well. Television, I can't say that television was very effective. To begin with, television in Nepal is weakened because of all the load shedding that we have to have. Even print media, while we critique the international media and response, uh, I must say that uh, the Nepali media also did not cover itself with laurels. It, where it did not do enough of analysis. And I think... Uh, if we are to learn from our mistakes in the part in the past, we should uh, go beyond the immediate uh, reportage of uh, the crisis coverage and go into a little bit of the 
the analysis relating to which is what will in the end uh, keep the politicians in check. Right. I don't think we've done enough of that. Uh, on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to end. Kanak Bani Dikshit, thank you very much for being with us on Rajya Sabha TV. My pleasure. And we'll be back again next week with another guest. Keep watching Indian Standard Time. Keep watching RSTV.